So this could start at plenty of time. 40 minutes or so. I have plenty of questions. <laughs> okay, wow. <laughs> so, yeah, like I told I told uh, your colleague, uh -huh. um, I'm thinking to write a portrait about uh -huh. you and your work. So I have lots of it's not the typical QA. Uh -huh. Might be a bit more than that. So. Right, there's plenty of Creative Commons material for you to work with. Okay. Uh, I can send you some. Yeah, great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw that all you have all these questions and answers online already, so mm -hmm. there's lots to read or there was lots to read. Right. right, and there's also a portrait uh, of with a uh, writer from the Libation uh, mm -hmm. from Louis eighty eighty nine and then right. you know, a lot of French media. Yeah. And they all very kindly agree to release the, the entire transcript as oh, creative right, commons. Okay. So can make yeah. use of it. Okay. Yeah, you're a very well known person, I would say, uh, in Western media. Lots of people wrote about you. Mm -hmm. And um, I have a very practical first question. Um, you are uh, you are, you are in uh, you were in IT business. You're in the you call yourself a. Uh, um, uh, civic hacker. <laughs> so I was wondering when you get up in the morning, what do you do first? What do you check? Are you online um, first or what do you do? When I get up in the morning, that's an excellent question. When I get up in the morning, I usually remain in bed for, for quite some time. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, I do check, um, I think, my notebook. Uh, and my notebook is, um, I have this very um, interesting tendency of lying in the bed and then mounting the notebook like this and then and just having <laughs> and, and <laughs> so it's kind of my, my morning ritual to to uh, take anywhere from half an hour to an hour okay. to wake up uh, while uh, replying to questions doing daily plans and so on until i feel that i'm fully uh, awake and then, and then i get out of bed then you enter the real world exactly yes yeah. okay. which is just another thing that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. And um, yeah, you worked as a very successful uh, as a business person mm -hmm. before. Um, what brought you to politics? Well, I, I was immersed in it. You know, my, my parents, my uh, uncles, my aunts, they all worked in public service. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of them are, are like high court uh, judges. Some of them are um, like deputy um, chief editor in, in a very political, at the time, newspaper. and. Uh, Many people work in um, the, the civil service in, in, as engineers, as other um, roles. So you know, when I was very young, uh, we talk about the public service all the time, and always from a uh, tradition of professional like, career of uh, public servants or politicians. Uh, and then the democratization came, and then the, um, the Panaman Caucus came. And then my, my dad shifted uh, his uh, research focus to, to focus on student movements. Mm -hmm. And so I, I moved to Germany for a year, as you know, and uh, work with uh, the exiles and talk about the democratization, what, what was their idea. And of course, they, they were the exiles were stu students at a time, like 20, 22 or 23. And so they are also still pursuing their own education. So it's very much a learning circle kind mm -hmm. of feeling. And then we, we talk about how um, it might have been different uh, all the time. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that, that's when I get interested in, in politics and also in just general public administration uh, in general. So I, I learned a lot about that. And then when I came back to Taiwan and I entered uh, the early development of the World Wide Web, uh, that was very much politics as well, because it's a bunch of anarchists, really, who don't believe in, in voting, in presidents, in, in anything. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but they still have to get together and work somehow mm -hmm. uh, and make the world web happen. And this is what we call a rough consensus kind of um, politics system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, and it's characterized by nobody has um, force power over anyone to do anything else. It's very hard to do that over the world web especially in its infancy, when anybody can say, I'm out of here, right? Yeah. So so, um, so, it's purely by volition. It's purely by everybody's willingness to, to contribute. And it's kind of a virtuous uh, cycle, because people who don't communicate or don't contribute generally just fade away from the community. Mm -hmm. And so the early web was characterized by this highly altruistic, um, and nobody can really force anyone to do anything mm -hmm. kind of situation, which gives rise to a an anarchist uh, politics system that actually works. But do you think there's still all this web anarchy? Uh, mm -hmm. Because um, since the early days, mm -hmm. um, the internet got much more commercialized. Exactly. There are lots of sharing platforms, mm -hmm. but also on the other hand, also sharing mm -hmm. got commercialized. Exactly. Yeah. 
did it change a lot, or do you think there's anarchy left? Well, at the core, it's still it's still operated by both instances. At the core, uh, still no state, and especially after the U.S. Uh, gave uh, ICANN the autonomy, the the core of the internet is still decided by a what we call a multi-stakeholder approach. Of course, all of us are much older now <laughs> and much more uh, mellowed, I would say. And but but still, I think it's it's the same principle at, at play. It, it's just we put a lot more empathy, a lot more listening, a lot more social learning uh, in it. Uh, it's what you learn after 20 years. Um, but, but at the core, still nobody can force anyone to do anything else. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the, the core condition that creates this whole okay. system. And you're also um, in charge to make, make governmental work a lot, uh, much more transparent. Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you think there are borders of transparency where things shouldn't be too transparent at some point? And can you describe these models? No, it, it varies uh, each person by person. Okay. Right. Uh, it, it's I think for me, uh, privacy and transparency, they're they're uh, like two sides of the same coin. Um, and um, it's very important for everyone to know that where that the coin is uh, on the spectrum, uh, because without uh, spelling out exactly uh, how comfortable am I of like how close uh, to you should I sit in and so on, these kind of um, what would we call um, a personal order or personal uh, negotiations, interpersonal negotiations. Mm -hmm. A lot of that happens non-verbally uh, when we are face to face, mm -hmm. but across the internet uh, it's very difficult to, to give signals right? that, that uh, I'm not very comfortable and so on. So that's one of the things that we're working on. Uh, is to, to give a clear signal uh, to everyone participating in our meeting, for example, to say, okay, so everything will be transcribed. Our, in fact, many of them are stenograph, that is to say, transcribed in real time. But I would say then, uh, but everyone on this table have 10 days to visit this transcript mm -hmm. and uh, remove the parts that you think uh, that may, you may spoke too fast or too soon or maybe embarrassing. But everybody else on the same meeting uh, are still looking at your changes. So you cannot really introduce substantial changes. Ah, okay. Right? So you can't censor. You, you can't censor what, what you said, because then the people who spoke before you and after you wouldn't make sense. Okay. Right? But you can remove one or two adjectives that will get you in trouble on this okay. right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, And Germany, we tend to authorize and to use the Sure, of course. But, but I mean, I, I mean uh, traditionally closed door meetings. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I, I mean like traditionally uh, internal meetings that are by the current law in Taiwan, uh, there's no mm, mandate nor uh, requirement for anyone to make public. It's not illegal to make those internal draft documents uh, public, mm -hmm. but it's not required by law. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not even governed at the moment by freedom of information mm -hmm. access requests. So um, it's entirely of the people's uh, discretion who participate in the meeting. So unless we say it before entering the meeting that we're going to make this public, it will probably never be made public until you know each and every one of these people, very busy people, sign their their release forms, which yeah. uh, very rarely happens. Right. So so what what I mean is that uh, by giving everybody like ten days or however many days they, they feel comfortable with um, to to edit a transcript. And in the end, what we saw of the edits, because I've been here for, for months now, mm -hmm. and we have a lot of those meetings and a lot of those edits, mm -hmm. uh, and by giving everybody a collaborative button to make edits, all the edits so far I see are that of providing more factual references. Mm -hmm. Like when I cite somebody's research, uh, and then somebody uh, goes and look it up, some, that somebody can add a link to the oh, transcript. Wow. So people looking at the transcript can click on it and get a better idea. And so far, nobody really thinks of themselves. <laughs> well, I mean, you said it's sometimes hard to make all the communication transparent because mm -hmm. probably laughing, smiling, all mm -hmm. this non-verbal communication mm -hmm. is hidden. Do you do you think I thinking about ways to make that transparent too? Yeah, of course. It's it's through this very important you mentioned in uh, human communication called emoji. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so simple. <laughs> it's a simple question. No, 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 it's not. <laughs> Making things transparent is one thing you can mm -hmm. do, and then you have all this data on the web, and you can check. But are people checking and trying to get access to all this data yeah, in China? Yeah, they are. They are. Um, 
because um, in, in Taiwan, what we call a civic actor. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think this, this term really came into popular uh, mindset around the time of, I would say, Aaron Schwartz's case. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure that it impacted uh, people mm -hmm. um, in your country as well. Maybe not as much as Edward Snowden, but, um, but people are generally aware that there, there are people who are hackers in the sense that they uh, make new rules uh, out of new situations instead of retrofitting uh, new situations to old rules. Mm -hmm. Like they make their own rules. And meanwhile, um, forces the establishment to reevaluate uh, its current regulations. Mm -hmm. and, and so, but they are not um, cybersecurity hackers, right? They are not white hat or black hat mm -hmm. hackers. They are hackers in the original sense, in the people uh, who immerse themselves in a system and try to find new creations, model creations out of it. So when uh, somebody sees a loophole or an issue in the current system, uh, the cybersecurity hackers will want to exploit or to change or to patch, that is to say, to fix it, right? Mm -hmm. But the, the uh, creative kind of hacker or civic hacker will want to make a new system that doesn't suffer from the, the flaws of the old system. Uh, okay. and, and that's the, the main difference okay. of a civic hacker versus a cybersecurity hacker, okay. right? And can you give mm -hmm. me a practical example what you did as a civic hacker? Of course. In that yeah, there's, there's plenty of, of, of examples. Uh, for example, uh, one of the um, very early cases that we worked on uh, was this dictionary. It's mm -hmm. called the MOE Dictionary. Mm -hmm. It stands for Ministry of Education Dictionary. Mm -hmm. And this dictionary, if you go to MOEDIC.tw, um, mm -hmm. you would see um, a lot of... Oh, why don't we just do that? Uh, you would see um, a lot of words, right, like this. Mm -hmm. And then you can learn, a lot of people indeed learn uh, Chinese, uh, like young people on this, but you can also see the English, French, and German wow. uh, <laughs> versions <laughs> <laughs> of, the, of the same word. And so you would say that citizens, and then people. And then you can cross-link it to the other two major languages in Taiwan. This is the Taiwanese Holoc. The Minan. Um, and then there's also uh, Hakka, which is another uh, population in Taiwan. And there's also the so called cross strait dictionary, which lists the mainland Chinese and uh, Taiwan Mandarin and how they compare. And maybe for the same name, we mean different things. And for the uh, same thing, we use different names mm -hmm. and so on. And, and the, the, the magical thing about this is that um, it's about 10 different websites uh, all meshed up together. So, so in the about page, we would say that, uh, for example, the initial um, corpus of the Mandarin Dictionary mm -hmm. came from a creative license, um, like Ministry of Education source, and then Taiwanese Mina and Taiwanese Hakka all came from different sources. But it's all volunteers uh, doing this, and, and so at the end, I have a declaration that says, as the author, I relinquish all my copyright to the public domain. So uh, this is compatible with anyone else. Anyone else is uh, encouraged even to take this and say it's their work. It's OK. And I, I will, include it. And include it. Okay. And, and then also release it to the public domain. And so we use a lot of these contributions. And it wasn't like that when it started early 2013. Mm -hmm. um, because at the time, the Ministry of Education's Dictionary website was still uh, in a legacy encoding, meaning it doesn't support you encode mm -hmm. more emojis. And then it doesn't, um, it doesn't work on mobile phones because it was last updated in 96 and mobile phones mm -hmm. wasn't invented back then. Mm -hmm. right? And you still see like best view with IE 5.5 or NSK 4.7 yeah. plus. Right? And so it's a very old website that's really blocking the, the children to learn uh, Chinese language mm -hmm. using their phones. But it also said all rights reserved and then there's no linking to individual terms. So I can't even bookmark or share it with yeah. you. And then, uh, of course, all the um, more complex or really characters are bitmaps, so you can't even copy it out on Twitter. So it's a very inaccessible uh, dictionary. So what we did was to manually download everything and then to uh, convert it into structured data and then make our own uh, applications out of it and so on. And we did that, like maybe hundreds of us, uh, in just a, a day or two. 
-hmm. and, and so it's a very organized effort. Mm -hmm. And then we say, because we uh, re relinquish all our copyright, mm -hmm. there is no legal ground to sue us, because it's clearly fair use. We're just converting from, it from A to B. We properly credit the Ministry of Education. Mm -hmm. And then so we, we argue it's fair use. But the fair use part in Taiwan's copyright law has never been tested this way. So, so there was, this is really hacking. Civic case. This is civic hacking, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and then we, we took almost two years to reach an agreement with the Ministry of Education. Mm -hmm. That first they agreed it's fair use. And then they welcome our contributions. Like we ran a campaign where we helped identify the typos in the dictionary. And so we identified some 4,000s of them. Wow. And then we use machine uh, plus uh, crowdsourcing. Mm -hmm. So for, because the website was really popular, it's about, I don't know, 10 million visits per month. Um, so whenever I put a call for action, uh, yeah. even just you know 0.1% of people participate, it's still a lot of people. Yeah. And so I, I then use this platform in coordinating with the community to help digitizing the upper region uh, paper dictionaries to digitize a lot of uh, like Amis Francais of origin versus European language. These yeah. were done in the paper-based days by uh, like people preaching at the, the tribes, the Aboriginal civilizations. And so, um, again, when I call, and when we call people to fix typos, to digitize, they just came, because it's a game that's meaningful, right? Mm -hmm. They're preserving the culture, they're preserving the language. And is there a similar project you mm -hmm. are working on in the future, or you have in mind? You want oh to yeah, certainly. Um, so, for example, um, a lot of the transparency or accountability uh, efforts are really just frameworks because we provide the raw data or we provide some um, Excel-like uh, tables for, for people to, to look at. But for many people, what, what they care about is not the, the totality of the, the budget. Instead, um, you can look at, for example, this is a website for budget by type A. Mm -hmm. And then it use visualization to show each uh, bureau and then you can also see how it changes uh, year to year. And then you can also drill down um, to any of those specific, um, like this is the education budget, this is the social budget, and so on. And then, um, and then you can drill down to the details. So by making information transparent, you also mm -hmm. mean making it accessible and easy to understand. Yes. Okay. And, and, and then making them into what we call social objects. Meaning that people can have a reasonable discussion around this particular yeah. budget and then share it. Okay. And when we first rolled this out in Taipei City, uh, people just commented on this, right? Uh, I saw a park budget, why don't I see a park yet? Or things like this. And then uh, after three weeks, every single uh, discussion thread gets material response from city officials. Uh -huh. And city officials feel proud because it's very rare that they get to speak directly with people and, and solving people's problems and show how professional they are. Mm -hmm. right? Usually they are, they are behind mayors who are behind the city, city council. Right? And, so, and then so, so it's a learning experience also for those civil servants yeah. to, to go across this kind of interface and focus just on the thing that they're, they're good at instead of what, what's the hot topic of the day. Okay. Right? So, so we are planning to introduce this kind of system to the national budget also mm -hmm. and then to, to allow people to track uh, the the various large scale um, like policies like the so called Asia dot Silicon Valley mm -hmm. project or the, the digital nation project. There's mm -hmm. a lot of those huge projects going on, which there's a lot of budget, right? So so what we would want to do is to, to give a progress bar mm -hmm. of, of each and every single item uh, within this huge project and let people who are expert in this small item to have a conversation of how exactly they make of the monthly reports that uh, every uh, civil servants make. When a politician or a government mm -hmm. wants to be very, or is very transparent, mm -hmm. that means also, I guess, much more work and you have to react much quicker than probably you used to be before. How was the reaction of, by, of, by, by traditional, more traditional politicians to your work? Well, um, I, I wouldn't say it's more work though, because in, in crowdsourcing, uh, we, we also crowdsource a lot of moderation work to the community. Mm -hmm. So for example, for the Uber case, we, we used a um, system where we showed everybody um, the basic facts about the Uber uh, ride sharing, and then people just vote uh, on each other's sentiments. So it's kind of an open-ended survey. 
if you uh, click like um, so this this person Chen Wu, which is random, uh, uh, said um, I, I feel that even the taxi license are not uh, currently being enforced uh, strictly enough. We can't really um, guarantee the quality of drivers. Mm -hmm. So if you agree or you disagree, you, you move in this uh, two-dimensional visualization. Mm -hmm. So this person said, I feel that real ride sharing uh, must allow the taxi, the cab driver, to select the, the route and then just pick people along the way. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's not really ride sharing, mm -hmm. whether you agree or not. So you have yeah. Uber in, ta in Taipei? Yeah, we have Uber, yes. Yeah. And then and there was this huge uh, debate over it last August. And then the consensus that we made in this, which we have two, probably speaking, um, camps, right? One feels that it's public safety issue, yeah. and one feels that it's, um, if not, I'm not in a rush, I will still call Uber, <laughs> uh, even though there's taxi in front of me. <laughs> and so it's two very different sort of people. And they, they did give rationale to, to um, what, what they make of it. Yeah. And then finally, we still have consensus. So, so these consensus items marked by 92, or 92 like this, um, basically is things that despite their differences, people can nevertheless agree. Mm -hmm. And then so, so this person said, I feel that uh, the government should introduce an e-taxi plan that introduce the same five-star five -star system uh, like Uber, but, but legalized it, mm -hmm. and in a way that's uh, like properly um, compatible with the taxis, and so that everybody taking traditional taxis can still enjoy a better mm -hmm. uh, service quality. And you, you would uh, see that this is agreed even by the Uber drivers themselves. Mm -hmm. so, so it's clearly that a, a rough consensus that's lost if you just focus on the polarized mm -hmm. opinions. And it was indeed very polarized. We can see it in the four corners. It started with people in four corners who doesn't overlap at all. Mm -hmm. And so over three weeks, people, because we say only um, the things that you said that convinced across the board 80% or more people gets to be our agenda mm -hmm. when we meet with our representatives. So this kind of um, competition of sorts uh, makes people willing to propose more eclectic, more uh, considering uh, mm -hmm. options. And then all this moderation was done by, by the crowd, because just by clicking yes or no, okay. you're, you're, you're doing the moderation. And how do you translate all the information mm -hmm. you get from the crowd into your mental work? Right, so, so then by the end of this, this machine learning algorithm generates, and this open source, of course, uh, generates a list of top consensus and the top controversial points. And then we just commit ourselves to respond to these points and nothing mm -hmm. else. So even though there's hundreds, maybe thousands of comments that are, frankly speaking, not very civilized, um, they, they get filtered out by the community and by the algorithm. Mm -hmm. So we don't even spend one single second yeah. uh, looking at them. So would you recommend to put this kind of system into platforms like Facebook and Twitter to decide, to, to let the crowd decide if that's good or not? Because, for example, in Germany, we have lots of problems with hate speech. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. one to use. Right, but, but it's very complicated with Facebook because the, for this kind of system, once you voted the, the things you like and people arrive on consensus that they can agree, they move on, right? They move on with their life. We all have our lives. But, but Facebook, on the other hand, wants to, to maximize the time you spend on it. So, so it's uh, reinforced via a very different reward mechanism. So, so if you feel that, that you have maturely reached a consensus with people who don't even care about being the same angle as you do. This is, of course, a very rewarding experience, but it's very time limited. And after which, you, you wouldn't want to revisit this conversation again because yes. it's settled. Okay. But for Facebook, it means a loss of uh, advertisement back revenue because then you wouldn't spend a lot of time on Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, while I think it, there's room for this uh, on social media, Facebook is about the, the last platform I would imagine to okay. adopt this. And do you have an idea how to minimize hate speech? On Facebook, for oh yeah, there, there's um, there's a, a lot of work actually uh, psychological work on this. There's this uh, anti-cyberbullying uh, campaign mm -hmm. that says I'm a witness. I think that's the name. Uh, where uh, just last month, really, when I was still consulting um, with Apple, um, I learned of this uh, new emoji. Again, we go back to emoji. <laughs> um, uh, I do think emoji is very important. Um, so, um, 
So uh, of the all the emoji um, keyboards, there is a I in any speech bubble. Uh -huh. Are you aware of, of this emoji? Okay, so maybe we didn't do our work. <laughs> okay. So um, so there's this mysterious uh, I in the speech bubble mm -hmm. emoji that if you use a iOS, I think um, other platforms are starting to, to support it. It basically sees, says, uh, I see bullying. I am a witness. It's a very quick way for people to, instead of clicking like or hate or, or any other limbic system signals, uh, to, to click the comment and then just I was a uh, speech bubble. And the, the idea is, in, in hate speech or in cyberbullying, really people are performing for the onlookers. Right? They're, they're not really um, performing for themselves mm -hmm. or for their, their close-knit group of friends or even for so-called victim groups. You know, they're, they're trying to influence the, the emotion mm -hmm. of the people who just happen to, to, to look at the thread and try to get them to associate some group of people with some very negative emotion. Mm -hmm. And so uh, through studies and um, some uh, social work, we found that the, the symbol of the, the eye is really important in that it gives a, a sort of different reflective space feeling to it that says we're not silent onlookers. Uh, what you're saying is hate speech, mm -hmm. but we're not censoring you because it's freedom of speech after all, and especially on a, a public forum where it may be very difficult to get a successful uh, appeal or a successful ruling of whether this is speech or not. Many people walk this very fine line of not like straight out hate speech, but, but uh, innuendos, mm -hmm. right? And then so by, by just responding timely and with less effort than it takes to write the hate speech, mm -hmm. we can create a culture in which that it's not okay to, to, to bully online. Mm -hmm. And do you think it's, in fa for example, Facebook's responsibility mm -hmm. to minimize hate speech? Or is it the responsibility of the users of a page to, to um, do something against it? Well, I think it's everybody's responsibility. It's, it's silly to, to say that responsibility lies in which operator mm -hmm. or which user. Right? Uh, when, when we see hate speech, most of the time we don't do anything because it takes more effort, more emotional work uh, than the people who propagate hate speech, who is probably just copy pasting things. Mm -hmm. right? uh, and then, but if we make it the system such that it uh, takes less work, then it becomes everybody's responsibility. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, now we're sitting in this very beautiful but very formal office oh, yeah. and uh, you work as a consultant for Apple mm -hmm. and in my mind when you work for Apple it's mm -hmm. a very laid back, different atmosphere, mm -hmm. lots of work but very different mm -hmm. style of atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Are you missing that? Well, uh, not really. <laughs> well, I work with Apple, not for Apple. Yeah, yeah, you're uh, yeah, yeah. yeah it, it, it's actually important because I'm, I'm Apple, in, in many ways, is like a government. Um, there's a lot of things on the know basis. Uh, they were, I almost said paper. They were uh, very, very confidential for a lot of things. And there's a lot of uh, decisions that, that gets made uh, by maximizing a huge population of people's um, well-being or happiness or whatever. That, that was the, the scale, right? Mm -hmm. so, so in many cases, the, the decision makers in Apple do think uh, very much like a, a government's administrators do, um, even virtually, just for a segment. But I, I, I'm just referring to them as their, their mentality. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, of course, includes things like accessibility, like giving um, like voiceover to blind people, like making people who are uh, disadvantaged to nevertheless able to use computing. And all, all this, as Tim Cook says, are not reflected in the earnings but they feel uh, as a duty that they have to take care of these people, which is a very governmental way of saying things. Right? Um, but what I'm saying is that when I work with Apple, I work always in Taipei. Um, I visited the Silicon Valley for maybe three or four times over, over the past eight years. Um, so it's entirely tailor-made uh, my work environment. Mm -hmm. So I, I wouldn't say that I miss uh, the Silicon Valley atmosphere because I'm never part of that atmosphere. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm a friend with a lot of people there, but I am not particularly fond of um, you know, rising uh, housing prices and all those issues in San Francisco. Um, so I, I do find Taipei a much, much more hospitable uh, place to live in. So in, in many cases, that haven't changed. And then uh, this formal setting, 
um, I only um, use three times uh, a week. Uh, and then for the other two days, uh, which is Wednesday and Friday, I work remotely. Uh, so I'm a teleworking minister. There's already uh, laws and regulations who enable public servants to work in a teleworking fashion. It's just no ministers have ever exercised it. Uh, right, so, so um, which is why I made it my uh, part of the negotiation when, when I talk with the prime minister <laughs> about whether to, to come here or not. So I do maintain a lot of flexibility. Like three days a week I'm here just for meetings mm -hmm. and brainstorming and, and collecting ideas. But then four days a week I'm, I'm really uh, at whichever place I'm more, most comfortable with and then meeting new friends who may not be so used to this form of setting either mm -hmm. and then uh, come up with uh, more interesting or creative work as I did as a consultant. Mm -hmm. So I would say it's a blend uh, between the two. Of so do you have favorite spots to be, be creative for the work? Oh yeah. <laughs> um, you want to see it? It's in virtual reality. Um, yeah. Yeah, sure. sure. Okay. So yeah, I would say at the moment probably Saturn is 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 my favorite place. So um, right, so this computer uh, hooks to the the Vive, um, what we call the lighthouses, yes. and then um, is it doing now? <laughs> So um, just to explain very briefly, um, so this is where I, I have meetings, virtual meetings, uh, with people in the press or with just people remotely. And I do this by uh, just sitting on this very comfortable listening chair and putting on this helmet <laughs> and, <laughs> right, and, and use these lighthouses to track my hand movements. And what this does is that it translates my head and my hand's positions into a virtual avatar of me. Mm -hmm. And then, um, which you can see, like you can see now. Um, so, for example, um, so this is Saturn, and then I, I do have a tutorial online, uh, which I show people how to enter this interactive space with me, and so. Um, <laughs> This is my, my VR interview tutorial. So I gave yes. a, a interview with six um, school children, mm -hmm. and then who are all wearing this, but maintaining their relative positions in, in here. Mm -hmm. And then uh, basically saying, okay, they see me like flying downward, uh, like, like here, and then appearing with them. And then we, we had a chat while I was in Paris. And I was in Paris with a very bad internet connection, really. Uh, and so, but because this system only has to transmit my voice and the position of my head and my hands, it actually very bad with frankly. Yeah. Yeah, so, so people see a visual avatar of me, but then um, it was very fluid. And so if you just get into the system, you would appear as something like this. Oh, okay. Like before you give yourself a, a avatar. And then uh, if you visit my uh, place, you would see a copy of me, wow. and, and then and then chatting with you. Okay. <laughs> and then so then you decide on what you look like, and then it's exactly, exactly, and you. right. And then if you you don't want to look like a, a alien, and then yeah. you can change into a robot maybe. So uh, you change your avatars? No, I, I ask my visitors. Ah, okay. Yeah, to to change avatars. Okay. And then so from my point of view, then my my visitor becomes this. <laughs> So you're used to introduce those robots and just boring. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, okay. much, I much prefer for humans beings, but for people who are not in the same time zone, this is the actual the only practical way. Yeah. And then of course you can choose uh, all those modeling. It's very easy. It's like, have you played The Sims? Yes. Uh, oh, oh yes. So so then it's it's just like The Sims. You yeah. you choose a head, a, a body, a uh, a outfit, and yeah. then change it uh, to to fit your liking. And then you upload it to this online service called Mixamo, which rigs 
that is to say, put bones uh, into this structure. And then, uh, very interestingly, then you can make the avatar of you uh, do pretty much anything. Wow, okay. Yeah. And do you have to teach them to move? Was, no, no, no. no. These, these are pre-recorded okay. motion capture. Okay. So as long as it has your bone structure, yeah. it can animate you however you like. And then we um, upload it to this public space and so that people can just, um, when they're interviewing me, take maybe five minutes to make a model of themselves and then uh, become like that person, like this person, uh, in this open source um, virtual reality. Mm -hmm. And then you can even do some flying or so. Uh, and and the rules? <laughs> okay. <laughs> And the rules are, you decide on which mm -hmm. setting? Yeah, of course. You yeah. can also meet, I don't know. Yeah, you, you, can, you can import anything uh, in it. <coughs> yes, and even an entire screen of an entire web page or five web pages. Mm -hmm. <coughs> There's an art installation where people put Google Earth as the, um, the floor, mm -hmm. and then you walk on us. <laughs> okay. And, and, and that is open source. Too? And this is open source. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And you in, in uh, uh, de developed it or? Yeah, I, I uh, this is open source project. So of course my contribution is minor compared to the core contributors. But I'm I would say that I'm a, a very <coughs> avid um, person who develop application on top of it. So this for me is is really like the the early web, uh, because nobody really knows what the what this medium is capable of. Yeah. And then but but it's clearly something that links people together in ways that people haven't seen before. Right? It's it's not just me working um, in Saturn. Yeah. Right? This is me uh, working with you on Saturn. And so it, it's it's actually very different uh, okay. feeling. So mm -hmm. how do you feel when I tell you I've never done that? Do you think poor no, no, poor no, 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 no. person <laughs> because no, 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 no. she only knows this basic internet? No 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 no. Uh, I, I would then encourage you to try it. It only takes five yeah five minutes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so please sit down. Okay. I continue asking you. Yeah yeah please. <laughs> yeah I, I gave a lot of interviews okay. with, with the reporter on Saturn or Neptune. Okay. Or so I just put yeah, it on. Yeah you just put it on yes. And then I'll help you strap it after you put it on. Does it work? Oh, yes. Okay, somewhat. Yeah. <laughs> Stupid uh, hair. No, no, no. no. It, it, it's a bold fun. avatar. No, it's a <laughs> um, so, okay. so are, are you seeing uh, a planet? Yes. Okay, <laughs> right. Uh, do you know which planet? <laughs> right. No. So, <laughs> So so you prefer to travel um, to other countries or travel with these glasses? <laughs> Both. <laughs> Both? I, I I prefer to travel to other countries but bringing this glass with me. Okay. And yeah. you said you spent five months in Europe. Um, yes. what for? Um, a lot of things, uh, uh, my, my relatives, uh, a lot of them live there, mm -hmm. and then, so all you see is us, right, at, at the point, at the moment? Yes, uh, okay. I see these two, ah, that's your hand, right. okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so these are the controllers, Yeah. and then you can uh, use your uh, disc ah, okay. to, to control yes. it. Yes. Uh, like that? Okay. Right, like this, uh, and then you can, I don't know, click on any of those buttons and try to figure out what they mean. Um, right, so, so in, in Europe, uh, a lot of my work in Europe was um, just meeting with people in the civic hacking uh, circle. Uh, for example, during the Nidhi booth, um, I, I worked with people uh, who organized the digital commission in Nidhi uh, to help them or to hear their story of how they are using the same tools or technologies in, uh, in their Occupy compared to our Occupy in 2014. Mm -hmm. I worked with the Madrid uh, people to further these tools. Was it, your Occupy you mean the... The uh, Sunflower yes. Okay. Because it was really powered by very similar set of tools, whether it's 15M or Nidibu or, or any other Occupies. And um, the, the, the thing with those drawn out very long Occupy is that it gives a lot of ideas a, a 
place for experiment. And if they're good ideas, they catch up with people in ways that we've never seen before. So one of those new ideas was uh, the one I did that I just showed you, a massive online plus offline deliberation space where people, this is what I call scalable listening, uh, where instead of just having technology like radio where let uh, one person speak to hundreds of thousands of people, mm -hmm. we are now developing technologies that enable hundreds of thousands of people to listen among themselves. Uh, and I think this is something that brings some symmetry back mm -hmm. uh, to the communication structure that, that shaped the, the current life. Um, so, so yeah, so there's a lot of people in Europe who share this vision and mostly working with free software. And so I visit Europe to develop those tools and processes and point blocks. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. Okay. Now I found planet Earth. <laughs> <laughs> I think. Okay, great. <laughs> right, so it's, it's just a taste. Yeah. That's um, <laughs> no, fine. Wow. Yeah. And in Germany? Yes. When did you when did your family move to Germany? Uh, I think in ninety two. Ninety two. And you were how old? Uh, 11. 11, okay. And I read um, mm -hmm. that you left school quite early and then decided to learn different um, program languages, programming languages. Well, I didn't, I didn't leave school. I, I left high school. But then I went to graduate school. <laughs> so, <laughs> what? what? Uh, to, to graduate school. Ah, okay, uh, okay. But, but not, as a, not as a registered student. So just shopping randomly into classes mm -hmm. and, then, and then starting having conversation with uh, classmates and professors. Mm -hmm. And I think it's their, their tolerance of, of a random young looking person <laughs> <laughs> who, who obviously knows nothing about Heidegger or Kant or <laughs> Kadama <laughs> and then to, to randomly drop by those very seriously philosophy uh, classes and start saying nonsense. Uh, it, it's, it's really their tolerance of, of uh, taking me in into the academic community mm -hmm. and not discriminating me because I was just 15 or 16 and then uh, just taking me on the right of the philosophical tradition or the linguistic tradition or the mm -hmm. computation tradition uh, that, that I'm able to uh, to explore and create uh, much earlier than, than I would have been uh, if I have gone through the high school. Yeah. So yeah. would you change the education system because um, of your experience? When? Uh, because Wait. you said it was so helpful for you to just yeah, sure. drop in. Yeah, and, 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 and now, it's, now it's part of the law. Um, as of a few years ago, we passed three laws here in Taiwan mm -hmm. that enables anyone to, to make up a homeschool plan. Uh, and it's encompassed the entirety of K-12. Mm -hmm. So the, the automatic education system in any year, at any point, as long as you have a, a workable plan. And then you can just say, OK, I spent one day in school, but the rest of the time going to graduate schools, or, or that I want to practice um, in art, and I have to spend two days in school, mm -hmm. and so on, or zero days in school, even, as long as it makes sense. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not part of life for, mm -hmm. for many children. And was, what uh, fascinated mm -hmm. you in computing? Why did you mm -hmm. focus on that? Do you remember that? Is yeah, that sure. Specific? Because I, I, I started programming without computers, mm -hmm. and I wrote on paper. So it's this way of computational thinking uh, mm -hmm. that, that attracts me. It's much like um, learning music uh, without an instrument. Mm -hmm. it is, but just I, writing down notes. Just writing down notes, just hearing music mm -hmm. and, and writing down notes. Because it, uh, it's a lot like music, really. If you keep practicing it, uh, there's a way for you to, to preserve or to condense uh, a, a certain kind of intuition, a certain kind of experience yeah. into an expression. And that lets people who then play like Chopin's work to feel uh, what what he had felt uh, for for some time in, in his life is a is a preservation and recreation of experience, mm -hmm. right? And and of course with virtual reality it's much more direct. Right? When when I say you know I was on the International Space Station looking at us feeling homesick, <laughs> and, and, and you, you can you can um, you can feel that as soon as you put out the, the helmet and go to a similar position in the galaxy. Mm -hmm. Right, so, so that was the, the entire idea to give some um, sublimation uh, to, to the experience that we, we had as individual human beings and try to make it more social, try to make it in a way that we feel empathy towards each other is uh, very unique, but then come on experiences. Mm -hmm. I think that's the part of computing that draws me next. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so it's a very not um, or not stereotypical idea of what a non-computing person mm -hmm. has um, that fascinated you, writing down on paper actually, mm -hmm. not being in the virtual space in the first place. Right, exactly, yes. Yeah. Um, one question from a very different field, because sure. when I um, googled your name, mm -hmm. I found um, articles um, referring to you as the first transgender minister mm -hmm. yes. um, of Taiwan, and I was wondering... Uh, of the world, actually. Of the world, yeah. okay. Of the world. <laughs> so I was wondering, um, is it a label that is part of your daily mm -hmm. work here, or is it just the attention you get from far away? Yeah, yeah. I think Taiwanese people generally are so used to it, because I, it came out more than 10 years ago now. It's, it's, <laughs> it's not news anymore. Uh, I think it is news when you combine these two labels together, uh, which is why I get uh, attention from international media. Mm -hmm. But domestically, I, I just think it's mm -hmm. much mm -hmm. And can you give me an idea of the situation of transgender or LGBT mm -hmm. uh, people in Taiwan? Well, we had a huge pride parade, right? Yeah. <coughs> and and that was it on Saturday? Yeah, yeah, and the marriage equality law is to be passed any day now, right? Yeah. And then, which is, I think, the first country in Asia to do so. Uh, and um, there's a huge community. Uh, there's a lot of support community on the local forums, on Facebook, and you know, yeah. other social media. I would say it's it, it's it's normal now. Okay. Um, people, is, of course, there there are still people who don't feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. But then it's the same with any subculture, right? And there there are people who don't feel comfortable with people playing with VR. And, it's yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and what does it mean to you that there might be this legalization of mm -hmm. um, LGBT? Um, um, marriage? Well, I think it's it's so that we can spend our time focusing on your constructive things. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's <laughs> it, it, once you have the basic solidarity and then the basic humor right on top of it, then it's time to move on to work on okay. interesting things. Um, one goal of Taiwan is to become an Asia Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. How far did you go on that? My main contribution before I became a minister is to tell. Uh, other ministers, it's a terrible branding. Uh, so, so we Why? don't do that anymore. Uh, so, um, Ya Zhou Xi Gu was uh, <coughs> President Tsai Ing-wen's campaign. <coughs> Actually, if you look at the dictionary, it means Asia and Silicon Valley. So it's originally about linking Taiwan with the rest of Asia mm -hmm. and with the Silicon Valley. Right? It's not about Shanghai or copying mm -hmm. Silicon Valley. But because of an unfortunate um, fact of the Chinese language, if you put two nouns together, it's mm -hmm. like in German we link two words together, the first one became kind of an adjective. Mm -hmm. right? so, and, and so people understood it, some of them, as the Asian yes. Silicon Valley, which gives a, a, like a mock copy, whatever, of Silicon Valley feel. But it was never part of the, the policy. If you look at the policy details, nowhere did it say or say that we want to make a copy of Silicon Valley. So my, my concrete contribution uh, before I become a minister, as a poet, is to, to introduce a middle dot uh, between Asia and Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. So now it's now officially known as the Asia connecting to the Silicon Valley um, uh, project. Mm -hmm. So then people, everybody now knows that we're connecting, linking with Asia and connecting to Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. And so there's nothing about being a Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's important because Taiwan's main advantage lays in this free flow of speech, of ideas, and of mm -hmm. information, of the completely, uh, like, uh, complete freedom of expression and of innovation. Mm -hmm. And so if we say that we want to make a copy of the Silicon Valley and attract all the capitals, all the people, and everything, in, 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 to Taiwan, they, there's really, they, it wouldn't work. But what would work is that we establish very strong ties with the South Asian, with all the Asian uh, communities who have their own agenda, which is just fine, and then provide a, a pluralistic, but then fair, but then transparent uh, regulatory structure so that everybody is welcome here, just like in a Occupy, to test their ideas, mm -hmm. but in a peaceful way, and for everybody to see. Does it also include mainland China? Of course. Yeah. And are there also strong connections between startup, IT startup communities in mainland China and in Thailand? Oh, certainly. I mean, there's a lot of uh, manufacturing that's done in Shenzhen and in, mm -hmm. in other uh, ports, and, and that's where they're good at. Uh, we're not saying that, you know, we're not blind to, to reality. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, there's, on the private sector, there's huge 
co corporations, uh, cooperations going on between the startup community in mainland China and the startup community around mainland China, not, not just Taiwan. Mm -hmm. So in, in many cases, Taiwan isn't really having a privileged status uh, in access to uh, the Chinese startup culture. Maybe Taiwan did have a privileged status um, in the 80s when China was very selective mm -hmm. of its trading partners and its knowledge transfer partners, but it's no longer the case. Mm -hmm. So basically we treat um, mainland China like their students in Taiwan. We now treat, treat them exactly in healthcare and other rights just as any other foreign student mm -hmm. studying in Taiwan. So it's part of the, the normalization idea mm -hmm. that we want to bring, uh, do a strong ties with anyone who has innovative ideas, mm -hmm. regardless of where they're born. And I'm interested in your role during the Sunflower uh, mm -hmm. Revolution. What would you describe it like? Or what did you do with this one? Uh, I would say I'm one of the many, and then I will send you some CC license material that details uh, the, the exact role that I yeah. played. But mostly I was there to supply the uh, internet connectivity and the communication structure that makes the whole movement as transparent as possible. Mm -hmm. And I was just one of the maybe hundreds of sick hackers who do this. You were a key. No, I was, I was there first, but, okay. but, but that doesn't really give me any more power than the fragging power of saying I, I was there first. <laughs> but okay. most of the work afterwards was done by far more professional people. Okay. And um, was your engagement there also influenced by your father, for example? Yeah, sure, yeah. sure. Because we, we talked about a lot about how in a massive movement, how to continue its uh, peaceful demands instead mm -hmm. of escalating. Uh, and how the escalating back in 89 mm -hmm. um, led to the non-escalating, for example, around the Berlin Wall, uh, right? Because people see that as an example to not follow. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then it influenced all the non-violent organizations afterwards. Mm -hmm. yeah, so we talk about it. Okay. Yeah. And coming back to virtual reality, mm -hmm. um, is there a place you, you, would, you would recommend people to go, you can't go on Earth? Is there sure. something, can you give me an example? Does it have to be on Earth, though? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's not, like I was on another planet a minute ago. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, right, so I, I really think the, the International Space Station, or the Lagrange point between the Earth and the Moon, is a great place to be. Um, because then you get to see Earth and, and close enough, but also its relation to the solar system. Mm -hmm. But what it does, it, it's, it, it's not showing you some fiction. All it does is it takes the clouds away, right? Because on us, we're, we're blocked by the clouds, mm -hmm. mostly. And even at night, uh, it's still not so much visibility into the rest of the solar system. They're, they're more like wallpaper, mm -hmm. right? And, and then with a telescope, you can, you can really only focus on one thing at a time. So it doesn't give you a sense of proportion. And, but in the Lagrange point, or in the International Space Station, uh, it gives rise to what we call an overview effect. You mm -hmm. see an overview of us, and then it gives, I think, a lot more intuitive meaning into the idea that what we're doing, what we're making decisions, are for, as the Native Americans say, for seven generations in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, for when people are not really only on us anymore, for when both you and I uh, are basically just remembered by the work we do, instead of, of people we know, right, seven mm -hmm. generations down the line, uh, and many people will be on Mars by then, and they may not even be people. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, well, what I'm saying is that it, it gives perspective to the work that we're doing. And if it doesn't um, make sense uh, when, when thinking in that perspective, when you see us, there's no country borders, there's, you know, it's just one us, and every but it's on the same place at the moment, right? If it doesn't make sense on that scale, then probably it's, it's an illusion. Perhaps it's just ephemeral. Right? Mm -hmm. Perhaps it's just our you know, daily instincts talking. Um, maybe it's just petty politics. So, so it's a, a shortcut to, to do away with all these things mm -hmm. and then focus on how to make the civilization transition into a, a interplanetary a coexistence with artificial intelligence mm -hmm. way without uh, sacrificing any of our human values mm -hmm. and then with conserving, which is why I call myself a conservative anarchist, mm -hmm. conserving civilization as we know it. Mm -hmm. yeah. That sounds very good. Stuff. It is. Yeah. <laughs> so 
that's why you were on, why you are interested in philosophy because there is such a connection between, for example, virtual reality mm -hmm. and philosophy. Oh yeah, sure. Because it, virtual reality uh, takes the, the senses, the the phenomena um, layer mm -hmm. and makes it very apparent, mm -hmm. right? So uh, so then a lot of those philosophical concepts are, are given form, mm -hmm. and then and then the you, you can experiment with a lot of alternate um, consciousness states in, in that setting. So, so yes, I would say uh, it's a great lab for experiment. Mm -hmm. You, um, like I read, you retired, mm -hmm. was yeah. 31? 33. 33. And now you work in politics. Mm -hmm. what, what comes in your future? Are you continuing the political process, or could you imagine to go back to Business well, in, in my future, so, I, I, I would um, catch up with my um, colleagues on a stand-up meeting that I'm running late. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's, it's it's very close uh, future. <laughs> yeah, no, but, but I do think only in, in these um, timescales. Okay. Um, uh, it is, I think, very pre presumptive if I, I were to predict uh, what comes tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And after all, with this current state of world, nobody really knows what tomorrow will, will bring. So I just try to, to do my work for the day, and then uh, in a good enough checkpoint at the end of the day. Uh, so coming to your what I do from waking up, uh, what I do before falling asleep, <laughs> it is, is, is basically just making sure that everything that I did was published. And wow, yeah, that's and what I do too. <laughs> yes, yes, and, and, and a lot of that's us writers. Yeah, <laughs> yes, exactly. And, and then even even if I should not. Up. <laughs> and at least if there's a, a editor or a program somewhere somehow who will make the work that I didn't finish uh, public, because after all, that's what matters. And and then and, and I feel like okay, I can sleep. And I do that every night. So you want to make sure that something stays that you did. Yes, or, or not necessarily I did. I participated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That was very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> can I take a quick picture? Sure, sure. Of course. Of course.